Hello and welcome to this week here Friday for the Million Mom Movement. My name is Carmela Velarde. I am on the council for um, our movement and I'm joined today with our council members <laughs> Montreal. Um, we have Rachel Quayle, who is our operations manager, and Jody Parker is here with us today as well. So the other council members who are not with us, um, they send love and we're um, in full force here to really serve the community, to educate the community more about what the Million Mom Movement is. And so I'm a blue diamond with the company. I am in the superfoods arm of, of this company. And let's go into a little bit of the history of what the Million Mom Movement is. So about five years ago, um, the brainchild of Amy Venner is a co-founder with David Sandoval with the company Ethereum. all not on mute. So if you come in, please mute the lines. So they had started this movement and I never will going up to the, the, the booth at the convention and really seeing what it is this movement is all about. It's the activism arm of our superfoods company. And what's really powerful is that we have so much, right, that we talk about by ways of clean eating, clean lifestyle, and the toxicities that exist in our current society and how we can be the change. We can create a revolution with our real food revolution. And we're here as a community every day um, to support you on our websites, on our social media pages. But every Friday, we get to come to you on Fierce Friday with different topics that the field is interested in talking to you about. And that's what we're doing today for the, the second series of our gardening, which is our topic for the month of March. And today we get to talk about community gardens. And so we have some fierce experts in the field who we got the opportunity to interview and really hand select them from the different communities within Purium. And the Million Mom Movement is really all about empowerment, empowerment, activism, and education. So with these um, three important pillars, we're here to educate you um, every Fierce Friday on a topic. And this is not a topic that I'm super uh, familiar with myself, which is why I'm actually very excited to host it because I don't know very much about gardening. And we get to interview some experts for you to gain some value for your own home, for your own personal interest. And um, so the Million Mom Movement, we are a movement of many, but we had started out initially as, you know, moms on a mission where we want to call upon at least 1,000 in the community to impact 10 people to 1 million strong. And we believe we can do that. Period. And what we do want to focus on today is how do that. So, hang on a moment. I just wanted to check. So how do we do this? So I wanted to pass the mic over and have Tas Ferreira in Montreal, she's a council member, share a little bit about our pledge, what we're about, and um, pass the mic to you, Tas. Thank you so much, Carmela. Okay, so I am really excited about today's topic. Oh you know, my gosh, like I'm Carmella, glad that you're in a place where you can be a little bit closer to nature. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm really excited about this call because this is a topic that I don't know much about as well. Okay, so I'm just going to go into uh, sharing the pledge. You know, as Carmela was saying, this is uh, a safe space that we will share our activism, we will talk about the toxicity in our food, in our environment, from dyes, from artificial ingredients. So let's just go into the pledge and I'll go from there, okay? I will share my screen and show you this beautiful pledge. And please mute your line when you come on, okay? So I say this pledge with great honor, okay? And you know what I love doing? I love sharing this with my family because when we say it together, it just strengthens our value as a community and as a family. So I pledge to defend the health of my family and of myself. 
I pledge to reject GMOs, artificial ingredients, trans fats, and over-processed foods. I pledge to educate myself, read labels, and lead by example. I understand that my actions today will positively impact the health of the future generation. I am committed to sharing this mission until we are a million mom strong. This is our movement of many. So as Carmela was saying, I'm from Montreal, Quebec, Canada, right? And you know what I've noticed? That in the United States, they have this whole glyphosate movement and what was happening with Monsanto and Bayer, the whole lawsuit. And I noticed that it doesn't translate into Canada. Isn't that so interesting? You would think the whole lawsuit would include all of North America, but it's actually only United States. And the World Health Organization of Canada actually says that glyphosate isn't a big issue. It's nothing dangerous. I found that quite interesting. Kellogg's of Canada said that they're going to start um, eliminating glyphosate and the detox project as well, but not the Canada Health Project. So that I found very interesting how, you know, we have such agricultural land that they are not standing for that. So it's up to us to lead this, to lead this movement. And part of that, we have a petition. We have a petition that we urge you to please share with everyone. I think so far we have 124 signatures. We're looking for over a thousand signatures. And let's grow that to even more. You know, our goal, imagine a million families being aware of this issue. I would love to share with you how I began with this movement. This actually happened to myself. And I know this was all founded with um, Amy and our chair, Stephanie, who this personally affected her son as Zephyr with Cheerios. So this also affected my family. My son, I, always, I was working in the healthcare industry and my son actually had glyphosate toxicity and I had no idea. I brought him to so many doctors. We ran so many tests, so many genetic testing and they told us nothing about glyphosate. I had to find this out myself. When it was brought into my world, it, it was a whole awakening for me because I never knew it existed. I thought organic foods was a way for us to pay more. I didn't know it was an issue. I had no idea of this toxicity that was on all of our food. And with the petition, this is to target General Mills to get Cheerios, to get glyphosate out of Cheerios. Because, you know, as parents, we were taught to use Cheerios as, for fine motor skills for our kids. It's your baby's first food. And who knew all this time we were poisoning our kids, right? So I urge you to please share the pledge and share the petition to everyone you encounter. Because if I didn't know, there's so many other moms that do not know and fathers and caregivers. So when I started giving my son the solution, Biomedic, within three days, his issues went away. And after that happened, I refused to be quiet. I refused to be quiet with this. And I need to share this with everyone. And the best way to share it is to invite people onto our call. Invite them on our Friday calls, our fierce Friday calls, you know? Oh, and we have in the Purium app, we have something new, something new and exciting. We have the glyphosate. I think it's called 11, oh, like 11 toxicity to avoid something like that. But it's, it's in our Purium app. Okay. It's a PDF and you can actually share this with people. When I was on Instagram the other day and I saw a mom giving Cheerios to her newborn, you know, as a, the, the first food to pick up, I was like, no, you need to stop this. So you know what I did? I sent her that PDF. I'm like, just take a look at this. This is what happened to me and many other families. Take a look at it. We need to band together and stop them for putting all of these toxicity in our food. Okay, so I will be passing the mic to uh, Rachel Quails, our Million Mom Movement operation manager and the brains behind it all. So 
to you, Rachel. Hi, everybody. I've been chasing a lot of um, <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, stop. Oh, see? There we go. So if one of the council members could take over. Thanks, Jody. Um, everybody wants to talk today, I suppose. But um, hi, welcome. My name is Rachel, like Taz um, uh, introduced me as, and I uh, a value being a part of this movement and I love working with the council. Um, I help manage the scholarship program, which is one of our um, most popular topics. Um, we, Dave and Amy uh, Venner have been super generous over the last two years. So we started in April of 2019 and that year alone, we gave away um, $90,000 in superfoods and the business and then for all of 2020, we've been able to give away $120,000 in superfoods. So just it, those numbers are just staggering, being able to, to be a part of that. And what we need from our community are more people to apply. We haven't had enough applications um, for the month of January or February. So, um, you know, we're, we still offer the scholarship. It's been transformed a bit and um, it has evolved quite a bit from a six month scholarship. We've made it now a three month scholarship because we've really become business focused. And we feel that within three months with the help of your upline and the help of this council and this movement, we can get you going at a steady rate to be successful. So that's our goal. Um, please, if you know anybody who is not a brand partner, so that's one of our top criteria is they cannot be a brand partner. And a lot of times they'll apply and the process is so kind of lengthy. Um, you know, they can apply at the beginning of the month and we don't award till towards the end of the following month. So sometimes they get antsy and then they, they become a brand partner during that time and that's fine but that will then disqualify them. So I just wanna bring that um, point out to everybody. And um, yes, please apply. There is a video um, submission. If you have a problem with that, just bypass it. Cause I've heard some feedback that maybe it's harder to submit, but you must get with your upline. You must meet with that diamond and they will vet to see if you um, qualify or meet the criteria for the scholarship. So please go to our website. Uh, apply, submit the application, and um, yeah, that's, and we're having a little bit of a tech issue, but I'm working on that. So if you run into any tech issues, you can always reach out to me at support at millionmommovement.info. Thank you, and I'll pass it back to Carmela. Thanks, Rachel. It's such a joy to work with some of these scholarship recipients who I see some of them on the Zoom today. So welcome. And the sponsors and diamonds who also support them. So the Million Mom Movement Council, we're like the upline for them. And we all work as one solid team. We work really hard to support you guys. And the three pillars in Purium, which I'm really proud to share is economic empowerment, which is what the scholarships involve is the business opportunity. And then it's impeccable nutrition, which is the gift of the scholarship. But then the third arm is the environmental stewardship. So that part where we are going plastic free by 2021, which is this year, is so exciting. It's really talking about how our food print with our superfoods is so integrated with carbon footprint for us all to truly understand more about. And so today with our topic of gardening, so what we want to share is how our community here, right? We are forming community, we're evolving our community, and we want to talk about how we can involve ourselves in community gardens. So our first speaker today is actually somebody who is my personal friend and brand partner, and he hails from Perkyoman, Pennsylvania, where I live in Pennsylvania as well, so southwest of Philadelphia in the mountains, and we live in a very rich and very green area. And the man I'm introducing his name is Corky Sheeler. Hey, Corky, how are you? Can't hear you. On mute. You're on mute, Corky. There you there go. go. Yep. There we go. I'm doing very good. Thank you for the introduction. Absolutely. So 
you became a part of Purium's community and you loved your the CBD, which I have right here. I always have it nearby. <laughs> so cheers. And um, why I was called to invite you here to speak as an expert is because you inspired me at a networking event where I heard that your focus for your nonprofit is to involve the elderly community, the seniors with the youth and how they can form conversations over gardening. And this is a nonprofit that you're very passionate about. You talked to me about this for hours actually, and I love your passion. So I'd love for you to share um, today specifically about how your passion began for this specific initiative of you creating your nonprofit. Okay, thank you very much. If I get too long, cut me off. I'll just put this here so everybody can see my logo and everything. If you see that logo, hopefully you'll recognize it and that will be me, um, seniorsandsprouts.org. Uh, and I do want to say, I, I'm so sorry. After this, um, in this Zoom, we will have a blog to follow up with all of your information, the three okay. speakers, so that if you didn't catch it here or in the chat, we're going to be having a blog where all the resources that the speakers will be speaking about, including their information, they'll be sent out. Go uh, ahead. I was in marketing in a past life. Sorry. <laughs> the opportunity I go. I have stuff staged so people can see it. But anyway, Seniors and Sprouts came to me due to uh, some career choices I had where nothing on my end, but I was downsized, outsourced, laid off, eliminated. But every time I was upset with society and businesses, I found myself outside in my garden, in somebody else's garden, in the woods. I was just had to get away from it. So the last time I was laid off, uh, people kept pushing me about, you know, why don't you do something with your gardening, with your environmental issues? So that's where seniors and sprouts came. One of my jobs was working at a nursing home and I saw how seniors really love the garden and my wife being a teacher and with my kids I realized that they need somebody to guide them and you know show them talk them so this is the old family the, the grandparents teaching the youth you're not going to get it on the uh, internet or anything so seniors and, Sprout, seniors and sprout is going to the community because one of my jobs before was caretaker for a community garden I love community gardens but Seniors won't go because they can't drive and can't walk. And so take the gardens to the people. Uh, my gardening is more of a philosophy. Unlike Sean, I don't know about Nick, but these guys, you know, Sean has a business and he's been doing it for years and he's a very technical guy about this. I more or less have a philosophy about gardening as a way to detach and re-energize yourself with the environment. Uh, when you get in the garden, you need to shut off your phone, take off your shoes, and plant a seed. You know, that's the three main things. Um, if we can get kids to plant a seed, they then will take responsibility for growing that seed and learn about it. But the initial thing is to plant it. We can't get lost in the minutia of what is good and what is wrong, what is right. Just get started and let it grow from there. And... Yeah. You like that? Yeah, okay, thank you. But the whole thing is uh, having the seniors involved gives them, again, the conversation, gives them a chance to talk to the kids and have the kids learn not only about gardens, but about life in general. Um, I have a lot of other initiatives that I could talk about, but that's the general thing. So any other questions at this point? Or? Yes, actually the initiative, one of the initiatives you were talking about was the stoops, making it really simple, keeping it simple, and then um, being able to provide for these elders and then having the kids come and caretake, correct? Correct. Uh, giving the gardens away, basically. I would give a senior a garden. Uh, it's a small garden. I call it a stoop garden, but it's made out of a pallet, actually a pallet garden. It's, you know, three by three, three by four, whatever size pallet you have. I can go in, drop it on the ground, fill with plants and leave in under an hour and they have a growing functional garden. So, and if they can walk out to the back door, sit on their stoop, have the kids work it. You know, if they get too many tomatoes, hand your tomatoes over to friends to the neighbor. 
whatever it is. I want to keep it as simple as possible so people will stay involved. So. Now, how do you that. find these children? I'm curious. How do you find these children who want to tend to these gardens? Well, there's a couple running across my yard right now. Uh, they're out there. Do you have kids? Yes. I do. Anybody else have kids? Anybody was a kid? Does anybody have parents or grandparents? You look out there, as soon as you see somebody, that's it. I've never had a problem striking up a conversation. You start strike up a conversation and go. I'm working with some scout troops, some youth groups, and actually I, I'm working with the court system in my area to get some youth people that are in the system and need to give community hours. So I use them for some of my volunteer work that I can't get volunteers to do. I call them my MVPs, my mandatory volunteer personnel. So we get a lot of stuff done with them and maybe I'll save two out of 10, which is, which is good, you know. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about the education piece? You talked about the children, the elders, and you had recently um, got word, right? From a local facility to be able to educate. Oh yes, the, uh, the theater? Yes. Mm -hmm. With the COVID and everything, keeping distance, not being able to get together and gather, but I still wanted to keep the education process going. I'm working in relationship with my local movie theater, which was an old theater and they brought it back to life. Uh, they're gonna allow me to show documentaries there. So I'll be able to invite youth groups, scouts, community service at like 10% of what the capacity is and show them some nice videos, nice documentaries. To get kids to sit down and watch a documentary, that's not gonna work. But if they have to come or somebody brings them, and then again, if we can save two out of 10, turn two out of 10 onto this idea, it'll, it'll spread. But there's some amazing videos and documentaries out there that break down how gardening is, how farming now is industrialized with Monsanto, but it should go back to big gardens and not just farming. Uh, so this is very educational and that got me on to how bad our pollinator bee population is, our, our pollinators in general. So I've got a couple projects going where we make pollinator beehives and have the youth do that and we'll put them around the community in everybody's garden so we can help save the pollinators. Uh, so I, I'm really excited about doing that. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I can yeah. keep talking, but I, sometimes I talk too much. So I'm, I'm letting you guide me here. <laughs> no, excellent. So I love to just share with the community how you involve others, you know, and this is where gardening is to me, I thought a very personal thing people want to grow on their own, but then how you're really looking at how you can use it as an education piece to bring community together, I thought was really brilliant and um, really lovely to be involved in, in your organization to help you even fundraise. So, um, so yeah, I love, yes, and I love that, um, you know, speaking, we're in the Million Mom movement and how you've also involved your children to be a part of the movement together with you for the sustainability and environmental focus. Can you share about that? About how I got my kids involved or just share with the whole community? Yeah, your um, passion for gardening with your family. I never, I never saw it as a passion. I saw it as an outlet for me to get out and be doing stuff and get my, take my shoes off get my feet in the dirt, you know, get my hands dirty, eat a fresh tomato off the vine. You know, it's something that spoke to my energies that I needed that and felt good. Uh, so with all three of my kids, I have an environmental educator who's working for the state park system. I have an architect who's designing green structures and doing a lot of, when she does a rendering, she has a garden or some sort of green in all her renderings. And my son's a senior this year for environmental engineering. Uh, and somebody asked me, how, how did you get these guys to be all environmental? And somebody said, uh, he just drips environmental. I don't preach it and I don't twist their arms. I do it. And I just have stuff I say from time to time that they listen to and hear, it just drips on them. So 
doing the same thing with the community. If you're out there doing it, people are watching you. So you might as well just do it the right way, you know, and, and show them. Simple as that. And I more. No, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Corky. You're, you know, you were so inspiring to me and how you involve your children. Just, you're so humble with how you really bring there we go um how you brought environmentalism to the next generation and now you're thinking generationally so you're thinking you know outside of our box and creating new boxes and i really appreciate that from you and i want everyone to be inspired by whatever you can do and take from his initiatives because it just takes one person to start creating this and it's a ripple effect generationally. So thank you so much, Corky, for being here and continue doing what you do. I'd love to hear from you in the blog post to some of the resources that you did share. I will, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening, everybody. My pleasure. We're gonna have a Q&A afterwards, so stay tuned. And we're gonna go next over to Canada. So we are gonna move over to Montreal. <laughs> so I had the pleasure of interviewing um, this man, Sean Wayne Manning. That's not me. <laughs> communicative com uh, community this, uh, this afternoon, don't we? Um, so Sean, yes, I was excited to bring you on today and by way of Tas Ferreira, um, because you have a focus of urban seedling, which is your company. And it's really about um, inner city work with the community. So can you touch on how you began? Um, I know that you are a family business, so you, you have your wife involved. And um, I know that you had started over a decade ago. So give us a little bit about your journey yep. to creating this. Uh, well, it all started uh, when my wife and I bought our current home that we're living in with a small little backyard. And the, um, the previous people that lived there had a pool That's kind of a big thing here in the area that I live in. Um, small backyards and you have one little ground pool anyway they took it away took over there was a big area of can you hear me hey sean you're coming in and out can you yeah. try turning off your video okay. um and that might make oh, it sure. so you can hear you. Oh, okay sure um can you hear me now better yes thank you better yeah okay uh -huh. Um, so yeah, I, I started the business, um, my wife and I started this business basically because we had found this passion for vegetable gardening. I had a super productive uh, raised bed organic vegetable garden that I built myself in our yard. And I had a friend that came over um, back when, you know, coming over was a thing and you could actually spend time with people and, and uh, enjoy time together. Um, and they had the, the idea of, you know, let's, uh, maybe I could set up a garden at their house. And, uh, so I looked into see if that was an idea uh, that maybe could, could take, uh, have a little traction. Um, let's start the video again here. Cause I think my connection just got a little bit better. You guys hear me and am I a little smoother yep. now? Uh, yes. yes. We can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, yes. Okay, great. So um, I looked into the possibility of, you know, service where I'd go to people's houses and build them vegetable gardens and teach them how to grow food. Um, for me, uh, that has always been the the passion and the the goal is to empower people to have the confidence to grow their own food. Um, and honestly, the food is like the bonus. For me, the most important thing about my ability to grow food is the way that it makes me feel. I know 100% what 
I'm putting into my body. I'm using only the best quality organic material and fertilizers, all natural stuff, heirloom varieties, um, and things that I know grow well in my climate, in my area. And I get a feeling of pride when I grow food for myself. Um, it's really like our base human instinct is to be able to provide for ourselves. And one of the most important things, obviously, is to eat. Um, and when you do grow your own food, it really gives you a feeling of a, a boost in self-esteem. And so this is something that I try and share with people. Uh, I've been building gardens and, and working with people in and around my city here for the last 10 years. Uh, do a lot of work in schools, try and in, in daycares even, you know, I've, uh, we like to start young with people because that's when they're the most impressionable and that's when they're really ready to learn, you know, they, they more and more these days people at least young people often don't know where their food comes from. It comes from mom. It comes from the fridge. It comes from the grocery store. They don't necessarily know what and how and where they come from. Um, and so starting and getting as, as, you know, Corky was saying, encouraging people to get their hands dirty, encouraging kids to interact with the plants. You know, the amount of times that I see people say, don't touch that flower don't touch this plant don't touch that into their kids in the garden because they don't want them to ruin their their flower garden or what have you and you know don't get your hands dirty well at my house everything is edible in my garden and i encourage my kids to really play and eat and explore and 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 see and be in nature even if it's in the middle of the city you know that 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 disconnect uh, like Corky was saying earlier, unplugging the phone, putting it all down, um, seeing and feeling and listening to the insects and the animals and the bees and the butterflies and, and that, and teaching people about the, the cycle of life and the, and, and how everything plays a part uh, in the garden, whether it's, you know, a bug that we might not like, or like a wasp, people often are like, oh, wasps, I don't like wasps. Well, wasps are really important and they are great pollinators as well as, as beneficial insects and, and they can help defend and protect your garden. And, and so there's, there's, there's so much. Um, and, and my business, that's what we do. I started a little garden center. We sell seedlings. I grow stuff and produce for, 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 for my, you know, surrounding neighborhood. Uh, I do a lot of work um, where we convince big corporations and businesses who have a lot of unused green space to uh, ha let us install vegetable gardens, make them pay for it, and then get all the food donated to food banks and uh, helping people that need access to fresh, um, fresh produce and, and healthy organic um, vegetables. Um, and uh, yeah, that's... Uh, can I ask you yeah. a question? So how you do work with schools as well. Do you have much receptivity to with schools about bringing in organic gardens for the- Absolutely. The, yeah? Yeah, I, I've probably maybe built gardens and worked with maybe 50 or 60 schools. I talked with the school just today. Um, and yesterday I set up a new, uh, we're gonna be building a garden for uh, two gardens and a cherry tree for a daycare because they wanted to honor the the founder um, and he was very passionate about gardening. Absolutely. Schools more and more are very, very interested in taking the approach of interactive, actual tactile learning. Um, and there's no better way to learn about plants and the life cycle and that step in, in that biology sense and that's stuff that they teach kids in grade two and grade three, and even in, in, in kindergarten, sometimes really the, 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 the nature of, of plants. And so absolutely, it's, uh, it's something that we, we have a lot of receptivity when it comes to vegetable gardens in the schools. Um, the, the, the challenge now with new kind of COVID restrictions is uh, I'm no longer able to get into the classroom necessarily to be able to, let's say, do a planting workshop 
um, to set up and have them start growing their own seedlings. So we'll do it virtually, and then uh, we'll, I'll help them in the school planting the stuff, um, whether that I bring seedlings or it's stuff that they can produce themselves. Well, you further confirmed our green movement's growing, and I love hearing that we're a movement of many caregivers, aunts, uncles, grandparents, moms, and dads here. So I just want us to all know we are, we're making a move across the board with our green movement. And thank you so much. You've provided a lot of value um, in an inner city set setting, right? So tell me a little bit of your personal life, right? You're a dad of how many? Uh, I have three kids. Um, I have a 12 year old, a, almost 10 year old, she's nine and an almost six year old. Uh, the two birthdays coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, and uh, I live in a, uh, the Southwest of Montreal. So I'm down by the water. Uh, I'm right now sitting in my, in my, the front section of greenhouse. I'm very lucky that I live about five minutes away from where I work. Um, we are here in an old, so the, the greenhouse that I'm in right now used to, it belongs to the city of Montreal and they used to produce uh, flowers for the um, horticultural plantings in, uh, in, my, in my area. And they no longer do that. And these greenhouses were empty and uh, we convinced the, uh, the city to let us and a group of uh, other like-minded uh, nonprofits and uh, small businesses in food security or urban agriculture to take over the space and open it up to the community so that people can again benefit from this space and learn more about um, about food production and so we also opened up this little small garden center to uh, give people access to um, to good quality seeds and seedlings um, and so my my day-to-day -day is really uh, as an entrepreneur, it's nonstop, all day, every day. Um, and thankfully, I have my vegetable garden at home. I know I, I get to go home and enjoy, look and see and feel what I have at home. I, I, I garden with people all over the city. And yet I need to have that connection with my own garden and my own kids um, and getting them to go out and harvest and pick and eat. And uh, I remember, you know, I, I was the parent who told his two year old to go outside with a pair of scissors and or just start picking and harvest. Um, I find that the autonomy that kids can build and the confidence that they build interacting with a vegetable garden uh, is, is really, really special and, uh, and really builds a lot for them. And I've been encouraging them to kind of go out and, uh, and enjoy the gardens with me. Um, as they get older, you know, it becomes sometimes it's more of a challenge, but I know they're going to come back to it. Um, and, uh, and we're lucky. I'm lucky. I love food. I love cooking. I worked for 20 years in, uh, in the restaurant and restoration. Um, and, uh, and there's nothing quite like that fresh, fresh produce from the garden that I'm able to grow myself the most beautiful, delicious, uh, fruits and vegetables. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's really become, everything, you know, for me is, uh, is my passion for, 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 for seeing things grow and develop and, and, and managing and teaching people that, you know, vegetable gardening is not an exact science. Sometimes things fail, plants get sick, animals are a thing. And that's all just part of life. You know, the vegetable garden, the plants are so much like us. They're built, they're made from the same things. We're all just carbon and, and, uh, and we all need water and we all need sun and we all need food. And the healthier the plants are, the more resistant they are and the healthier we are. Same thing, you know, what you put in is what you are. And um, that's really what, I, what I'm all about. Amen, lovely. Thank you for sharing that, Sean. And sharing also, you're another dad on a mission, you know, along with Corky, really affecting your family, integrating community, 
sharing how you're creating it as a legacy project, possibly for their future, you know, if they want to take that on, but such is nature, right? Some will, some won't, <laughs> but we are all um, one, one great big microcosm here. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, appreciate you. And we're going to come back to you in just a second. So, <sighs> okay, so we're going south to Texas. But I believe, I'm not sure if you're now in Ozark, Kansas. We have a young man, his name is Nick Brown, Nicholas Brown. And um, what I was really interested is his, well, all three experts have different focuses and his is specifically a focus on regenerative systems and creating abundance for all via free energy and organic food production, as well as Sean and Corky. Organic is the underlying thread here, right? Organic gardening. So Nick, I'd love to have you, have you come on. Um, I know you're young here, but talk to us a little bit about your own permaculture focus in your consultation business and how that spawned. Welcome. All right. So can everybody hear me okay? Yep. All right, cool. So basically, I was born and raised in Dallas and, you know, living there, there's not much going on besides concrete. Everything's built up and it's just like bad food. I mean, not everywhere, there's some organic gardens going on, but I wasn't raised in that type of mindset. And then it was about the time I was 17, I started like questioning things, you know, I was just seeing the path everyone was going on. It's just like, this is life. You go to college, you know, you graduate from high school, you go to college, you get your degree, you work, 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 and then you retire and you die. And it's like, no, I just knew like that wasn't it. I wasn't like feeling good about that path so like right before you know i turned 18 i just decided okay so i want to take a different approach like i knew i didn't want to go to college already and i started i heard this term permaculture and it just was the very beginning of a seed that planted and by you know like again living in a concrete jungle the times i cherished my childhood most were being in the woods um just being outdoors and so like I visited Eureka Springs, Arkansas and the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas. It does sound like it is like Ozark, Kansas, I guess. But um, yeah, and right after I came here, like I saw the trees, the woods, all these like amazing people. And I just decided to move here like a week after I visited. So like packed up everything. I didn't have much, like had pretty much just a little bit of clothes. I kind of restarted my whole life and I moved to the Ozarks and that year i learned all about organic gardening like this whole community we have like two or three markets every week um there's two in eureka springs arkansas and then one in holiday island so like you just have the whole area just kind of blanketed in gardens and this whole kind of community outreach and like it just kind of was slow moving for me at first and then last summer i took a big leap and going to stay on a permaculture farm up in New York. And that for me was the point where I really started like picking up momentum in my studies for this. And I started a, a permaculture design course at that time, a little bit after that, and just started seeing how can I help bring these type of alternative systems, which permaculture, if we're gonna, if we were to define it, it'd be looking at every function biologically ecologically of each individual plant and animal and human system and how we can integrate these systems to create to regenerate um, our ecosystem our soils clean our water our air support pollinators like um, Corky was talking about and how we can apply it to every scale and in every position that humans may be in like um, I know Sean was mentioning like in cities like how we can turn um plots of city land or just so you know you have like maybe an eighth of an acre your house is on you can still produce a massive amount of food in that space and just with a little bit of awareness of like what zone you're in again like sean was talking about then you're able to better know what will work and if something doesn't work you can learn from your mistakes so it's i just kind of love the holistic approach to uh, gardening that permaculture takes on and the alternative ideas. 
And some of that that I feel like is very important is, you know, it's brought me awareness of what our soil actually is. And it's the lifeblood. I mean, obviously water is like a liquid, but the soil is the lifeblood of our food. And if we don't have good soil, we don't have a way to repopulate, to re reproduce, to continue forth as a species or even as a planet. And when we look out at a forest and we see why it's so abundant and growing so well, it's because the soil is covered and protected. Whereas, you know, with wood chips, so, I mean, leaves, branches. Whereas if you look at traditional agriculture, the soil is exposed. And that's, you know, they start with first year they ever introduce glyphosate, you know, Roundup, they spray a little bit on it. Next year, they have to spray a little bit more because the effects, you know, the bugs grow resistance. The next wave of the bugs is resistant to that. They have to make it stronger and use it a little more. Well, now we're at the point where the bugs don't want to eat the food that's being grown conventionally. Why should we eat it then? And it's, it's destroying our soil. You have this just openness when the crops aren't there, the sun beats down and you're drying up. But now all the fertility is gone out of that soil. So I just started working on solutions and seeing what works. Like even in organic gardening, I feel like a lot of it is still the um, idea of kind of exposing our soil. So one of my main focuses is the awareness of mulch gardening and how just adding a four to six inch layer of mulch on top of your soil, like skin on our, on our own bodies, how it protects that version of vitality of the soil. Um, you know, the integrity of it and that mulch will break down slowly. And after your first layer, each year you have to use less and less. You're not having to go buy new soil, fertilizers. You're not even having to water it because even if you're in like a, it, it, no matter what area you're in, let me take a breath. Hold on. Everyone should take a deep breath. <laughs> so I'll do but, a breath. Okay. So yeah. I just kind of, I could go on about this, but like mulch <laughs> is very unique in that if there's too much rain, it will drain off the excess moisture. If there's not enough, it will retain the water. So maybe you do an initial watering when you plant your seeds in, you just scrape a little line with a rake. You don't have to till anything. You don't have to like do all the extra. You don't need a tractor. You just plant your seeds, you know, and then cover it back up with the mulch, water it maybe once and then let nature do its course. Like the forest doesn't have to, you don't have to go water the forest. The forest grows on its own based on nature's way of reproducing and going on. So um, it's, it's about having less work for ourselves, but more abundance so that we can enjoy the Eden that we are placed in to enjoy the green, the mm. interacting with all these living things. So Amen. yeah, it's kind of, I guess, Thank you for, yeah, you shared a lot about your focus, your initiatives that you're, you're, you're doing right now. I mean, a lot, a lot of the people in our community have already heard of or watched um, Need to Grow, which is a really great documentary. Um, and so you talked on the importance of soil and uh, thank you for sharing that. You went into <laughs> your passions, of course, and your focus on, on the soil when you educate. So where do you see the future of what you're doing? What, what do you see for your future? Since you're such a young man, I thought to ask that. Right, so currently my girlfriend, we just moved out from the city to a three acre piece of land in Eureka Spring, the border of Missouri. And we were given this beautiful opportunity for me to do a, a flagship permaculture project, a whole design where we're gonna be building a pond um, introducing ducks and different fish and uh, you know all kinds of stuff we already have roosters we're going to be getting goats chickens and planting an orchard which we're going to be mixing in all kinds of perennials because it's like all again creating an edible forest so I see that this being as the steps towards like one of the first iterations of something that could be a example a, a flagship for not only other projects for myself, but on a larger scale for our community. Because this, you know, as we create intentional community and gardens and stuff like this, where you share the abundance, you inspire others to do the same. And so becoming a beacon 
of light globally, like thinking about how our actions ripple out. And mm. yeah, just it's a beautiful opportunity. That's where I'm at now. And I have a few other people that I'm working with to, we're doing a community garden. Um, and I guess this is an important thing to state too, is it's okay to like, you know, especially when you're starting things, if you're gardening, try different things. Like, you know, we're going to be doing Google culture beds. We're going to be doing just um, the mulch gardening that I was talking about. Um, just like try everything that you're interested in trying and see what works the best for you and in your area. Cause there's not a one size fits all in any of this. And so, yeah, just kind of, that's my main goal and motivation is how we can all learn about where we're at and just bring that abundance through because we're all truly abundant when we tap into it. So uh, thank you for leaving us with that, Nicholas. It's uh, very wise and um, how to connect the two with the earth. Of course, we're we're a very environmentally focused community. So we're so happy to have your voice here. So well Sean and Corky. So we're going to open up the field uh, for questions for you three. So there are some in the chat. But if you want to raise your hand, please, and then we'll call on you, one of the council members, if you could take a look at that with me. Let's take a look. Does he have a video showing mulch and planting? So we will be sharing their resources and their personal information on a blog from the Million Mom Movement to follow up. So these three men um, are people who we want you to follow and um, take a look at what their initiatives are. They're amazing, their education that they're putting out into the community. We're so proud of you know, people in our community um, connecting and collaborating. Does anyone have any questions? You could just come off, uh, first raise your hand. Uh, there's somebody who's asking, Chris is asking any books that you three would recommend. On the work that you do well uh, i could the, the the first book that i got um that really got me into looking at a different way of growing food and the like intensive garden so working with small spaces and having it be as productive as possible was um the and again this is an oldie but a goodie um, Mel Bartholomew's Square Foot Garden book. Um, that is what really uh, was the first book that, that I read and learned about how to maximize. And it also talks and goes into um, the kind of soil composition and, and that would be an ideal soil blend to produce in a very small amount. Because when you're in a raised bed, you don't have necessarily the, um, the entire connection to the earth and and then access to all of the nutrients and all of the bacteria and all of the mycorrhizal that um, are, are a part of a healthy living soil um, and so you need to try and continue feeding that and and maintaining that healthy healthy soil so you can have a successful garden in even just a few inches of soil um, and um, yeah so that that's that's a book that um, really got me started and uh, I recommend to everybody. Excellent, thank you for sharing that. Go ahead, Corky. Mm -hmm. You unmute yourself. There we go. There we go. I wanna to add to Nick and Sean about that, the mulch and, and the soil, because I use I said I use a pallet. Uh, it's a clean one-time use pallet. There's no chemicals. You got to be careful with that. But when I go to set one of my gardens up, I'll go in, I'll just throw down some craft paper from a horse feed bag or a piece of cardboard, throw that on the ground first, and then throw the pallet on top. I'll punch some holes for drainage of rain and stuff later, and then I fill it in with a nice organic mulch or compost, not mulch, uh, it's a compost and soil mix that I get from a local supplier. And it's, it's all good, good compost and soil right there already. And so there's no digging, no tilling, but it's only a few inches, like you said, Sean. And in, in the wintertime, then I recommend people put leaves and stuff on top of it. 
to try to get more nutrients back in as it decomposes. And in the spring, you just rake it off, you're full again, and you go. Um, if people use a regular garden, I, I recommend they put down boards or piles of mulch to walk on so that it saves a lot of the moisture and the moisture won't evaporate. And the decomposition will help fill that in. It'll bring worms in, bring everything back into the soil. Um, I use straight um, tree, tree, uh, tree wood chips. As long as you don't mix them in with the soil, you're not going to denitrify your soil because it's going to be on top of the soil. So that's where it saves a lot too. Um, I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Agreed? You guys agree? Yeah, right. Absolutely, I agree 100%. Yes, and you know, there's a great movie that I found on mulch gardening. It's called Back to Eden. It's very comprehensive, and it's just again, you stack like Corky was saying, a couple inches of your soil or compost, few inches, and then you know, if you want, do the five or six of your mulch on top. And also in the winter, if you're in a cold place, that'll keep your soil from freezing the roots of the plants. Um, just add some extra warmth. And so yeah, Back to Eden. If you want a really comprehensive book, it's like 600 pages. Check out uh, Permaculture, a Designer's Manual by Bill Mollison, one of the founders of the term permaculture, um, alongside with David Holmgren. And they're both excellent resources, plenty of books, and like, yeah, just awesome stuff to look into with those guys. So I wanted to add something. We all touched on composting, but we never explained it. Um, I actually went through a class and here in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, I'm what they consider a master composter, uh, but it's just a matter of letting stuff rot. Uh, a lot of times in your garden, I'll take a post hole digger, dig a hole and just put the stuff in the hole and cover it back up, let it go right there. Um, I do have a big pile because I do it large, large, but you can do it right in the garden and just move it around the garden as you go. Just remember no fats, no meats, you know, uh, that's what brings the rodents. Just keep it all green. Thanks for these recommendations. Great way to end the call, guys. And thank you so much. I'm a novice, so this is all wonderful information and just got my head more awakened to wanting to get involved with community gardening and getting involved with the community. So um, look out for our blog post uh, this week for um, more information from these three. And to wrap up, uh, please follow us on social media and you can find us um, on Facebook on our official page and group page for the Million Mom Movement and also on our Instagram. And if you hashtag Million Mom Movement on your posts, we will collect them and um, also be featuring um, those specific posts that are inspiring and helpful. Um, if you wanna share anything from this call and then we will, we do have a YouTube channel where this will be uploaded and you can, it is shareable. So if you found this to be very informative to want to share it onto your community, please do so. Next week, I wanted to alert you all to be invited and to welcome guests on. We have a very special guest as well. She is the nutritionist, author, and documentarian for the documentary, What's With Wheat? So she's also the founder of Changing Habits. Her name is Cindy O'Mara. So find us here again, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, every Friday. Have a wonderful rest of your week, guys. Thank you all. Thank you, Corky, Nick, and Sean. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Thank day. You, Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Nick, uh, let's keep in touch. Sean, let's keep in touch. Sounds good, Corky. All right.